Welcome and good evening. Welcome to the Willis Centre and to our evening of storytelling on the theme of the power of. My name is Con Karapanayotidis and I'll be the speaker kicking off tonight. I want to start by paying our respects to the fact that we gather on the land of the Wurundjeri and the Boon people, that every time that we stand to tell stories that we remember that we have before us 3,000 generations of storytellers, that we stand on Aboriginal land, that we stand on land that was never ceded, and that we recognise that, like I'll be speaking in part of our refugees, that we cannot have a free and equal and just society until we come to just terms with First Nations people. Welcome tonight to the Wheeler Centre. A big thank you to Helen Whittacombe um, for trusting me to curate tonight, um, which is really lovely of her to let me do, because I was meant to just be getting up and talking about my book. And um, I really wanted tonight to be about the power of, and I wanted to especially celebrate the power of women and the power of women's voices and the power of actually having people coming and speaking that actually reflect and represent the communities within which we live. And it'll be my honour shortly to introduce um, our second speaker and each speaker will take turns in um, getting up and sharing their theme on the power of. If you want to share your feedback, just use the hashtag the power of as your hashtag for the evening. At the end of the night, all these incredible speakers will be happy to take questions from you outside in the lobby and the lovely people from Paperback Books are here and I'll be happily signing copies of my book. The Power of Hope. Um, again, welcome and thank you so much. Can we give a huge round of applause to these incredible speakers? Okay, so I was thinking about what my um, theme of the power of would be. And today is 18 years to the day uh, that uh, I suddenly lost my father. And I'm thinking, I'm going to talk about the power of love. I think more than ever, in times like now, we need to talk about the power of love. The power of actually leading with our shared humanity. The power of seeing one another. The power of telling our stories. The power of vulnerability and fragility and compassion. At a time where we're being told, be afraid, at a time we're being told, be selfish, at a time we're being told to not see the other as one of us, but as a problem, as a crisis, as a burden, to poor, to black, to gay, came the wrong way. Whatever the theme and narrative that's telling us to dehumanise the other, to not see them as our brother and sisters, to not see them as part of our family and community. More than ever, we need to talk about the power of love. It was the power of love that got my father as a young man to get onto a boat as an immigrant to this country, honouring the love of his parents that wanted him to escape from the poverty of his little village in Greece. It was that same power that drove my mother as a 21-year-old young woman to also join that, join that journey on a boat as an immigrant to this country. It was the love of my grandparents as refugees to be able to sacrifice everything, to be able to raise their children despite all the adversity. It is love that held them. Every refugee and immigrant that comes to this country in search of that better life at the heart of it, that is the love of hope and is the love of community and is the love of justice and is the love of wanting a dream where you can be safe. Every time I have the honour and privilege to visit remote Indigenous communities, I see there a love of country, a love of family, a love of land, a love of, of their ancestors and of, of, of the 60,000 years of history before it. Everywhere we see these extraordinary stories. And at a time where we're being told to not see each other, these are the times that we need to have radical empathy. These are the times that we need to tell our stories more than ever. When we have men bereft of compassion and decency and a conscience, like Peter Dutton, who sits there and stands on the very bodies of refugees, we need to speak out against that. When you have a Prime Minister that claims to have family values, as long as those values only apply to him and not to the 102 children he imprisons on Nauru, all those families, all the men that he separates from, his, from their families on Manus Island, they are not values. 
That is just selfishness and hypocrisy. At a time where we're being, at a time where we're being told that somehow creating safe spaces for young people to express their sexuality is somehow endangering our education, we need to call that out. At a time where there are hundreds of thousands of Australians living in poverty, below the poverty line, we need to demand that they raise the rate. When First Nations people are telling us, listen to us, we know what is best, embrace the Uluru Statement, hear us, we need to stop and listen. When we see an epidemic of male violence against women in this country, where every two minutes the police are called to a family home, this is an epidemic and we need to act. Right now, there is not an us and a them, there is just us as a community. And right now, more than ever before, we need to be speaking out about the power of our voices and the power of our solidarity together and the power of the hope that comes when we stand as one together. Imagine if we had political leadership in this country that actually encouraged us to believe in the best in us, to see the best in us, to embrace the best in us that told us that we actually have far more in common than we have that separates us. That told us that anything is possible if we just tap into that moral imagination, that boundless entrepreneurship, that boundless curiosity and love and compassion that actually exists in the bones of most of us. Imagine the country we could be. Imagine what is possible. Right now, these bastards want us to think that we are powerless, that we are helpless, that we can't change things, that we can't make things better. They want to defeat us, but we are only defeated if we allow ourselves to be defeated. If we allow ourselves to follow the drumbeat of apathy and indifference and bigotry. If we allow ourselves, our hearts and spirits to be impoverished by words of hate and xenophobia and racism. We are defeated only if we sit there and say that somehow our compassion has fatigued itself and that our heart, our very beating heart, has stopped beating. We're actually not fatigued. Love doesn't fatigue you, love uplifts you. Hope brings us together. Community strengthens us. We're just fatigued by living in times that tell us that our hearts are bleeding ones, that tell us that we are too naive and idealistic, that tell us to harden, that tell us to hate, that talk about our own backyard and the very people talking about that are the very people sowing seeds of division and disunity in that very backyard and are telling us not to care for anyone. They just want us to care for no one but ourselves. That's where we are right now. We are tired and exhausted by sitting there and going, this is not normal. It is not normal that there are children on Nauru that have stopped eating, walking and talking. It is not normal that half of all Indigenous men my age are already dead. It is not normal that a woman is killed every five days in this country. It is not normal that we have young people taking their lives because of homophobia. It is not normal that hundreds of thousands of Australians, in fact, it's women over 50 as the largest population of homeless people in one of the richest countries on earth do not have a roof over their head tonight. It is not normal when Mother Nature is heating up and telling us, listen to me, the earth is in crisis, act and for us to do nothing. None of this is normal, is it? We've had enough of this. We've had enough of this. And we've had enough of these people sitting there, sitting there that are meant to be representing us, debating and using language like the final solution or it's okay to be white or having Nazis on primetime television. This is not normal. But what I want you to do is to not despair because we know despair is not a strategy. And fear and hatred and ignorance and, and sheer guilt, that's just going to lead to a paralysis of hope. The way forward for us is in the power of us, is in the power of love, old-fashioned bloody love, where we actually give a damn about each other, where we ache when we see another suffer because we sit there and go, that could be me. That we understand we have, loved, we have won simply the lottery of time and place. And that we can be better. And that we want to be better. 
That we want to raise the next generation to have love, not fear. The power is in radical empathy at a time where we are in such dark times, caring is a radical act. Speaking up is a radical act. Compassion is a radical act right now. Because at the heart of that, we are centering each other and we are centering the importance of one another. And that we are saying, we don't want you to build tougher borders and higher walls. We want you to build a longer table where we can all sit together and break bread like family together. Yesterday, I went and saw the exhibition of Nelson Mandela at Melbourne Museum. And my heart skipped a beat to think, imagine a man like that leading our country right now. How much we need a man like that. And just, you know, paraphrasing, I was looking, listening to his words and watching this footage and about this thing about we cannot despair, we cannot give up, we cannot allow injustice to triumph. It defeats us and it beats us only if we yield to it. So let us rise like the phoenix from the ashes of fear and hate. Let us triumph over the bigotry and division and small-mindedness of our politicians. Let us together build that bridge of hope, be that tsunami of kindness and possibility and of new beginnings. Let us bring together the power of us and the power of love and the power of hope. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's just what came to me and it felt right, so I hope you appreciated that. <laughs> thank you. It is my great honour to introduce the second speaker for the night, speaking on the power of. Banok Rind is an extraordinary and incredible woman. She's a proud Yamaji Budimaya woman from Western Australia. She's a registered nurse and currently the Deputy Executive Officer at the Koori Youth Council. Banak has a background in Aboriginal health and well-being and advocacy within the Aboriginal, with the, within the Aboriginal mentoring, leadership and health space. She has worked extensively in cultural competency within the university and health sector, as well as as an associate lecturer for Indigenous health at RMIT University. Her work heavily highlights the ongoing institutional racism prevalent within health services across the country reducing health disparities between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and is a representative of the Close the Gap campaign. I dream of women like Bannock being our next Prime Minister and when you hear us speak, you'll be hoping the same too. Can we give Bannock a huge round of applause? Thank you, Brother Con. <laughs> um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge um, country and the country that we're on, um, the land of the Wurundjeri people and the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations. Um, I would like to pay my respects to elders both past and present, as well as the future elders they'll nurture and take care of this beautiful land that we stand on. I'd also like to acknowledge all the, all the elders that are in this room who hold the baton of great amounts of knowledge of our people. I extend this acknowledgement to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this room today. We are here, we are proud and we are strong. I'd also like to acknowledge all the non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that are in this room today. The fact that we're all sitting here, sitting alongside each other, that within itself is a powerful statement of change. And I think that's so important for us to hold on to. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the power of hope, but the power of hope that my people have and that my people have always had for the last 60,000 plus years. So my name is Banok Rind. I'm a proud Yamaji Buddy Maya woman from up Mount Magnet and Geraldton Way in Western Australia. I'm a strong Aboriginal woman, I'm a strong Aboriginal nurse, and I'm currently the Deputy Executive Officer at the Koori Youth Council. I'm passionate about our people's health, but I'm passionate because I'm concerned about my people's health. Working in the health field wasn't a choice I made, but rather a decision it was I needed to make. Our people are sick, our babies are sick. Our people are unwell. And I'm not here just to tell you and focus on how ill my people are, but I'm here to give you a timeline of what once was, what still is, and what could be with the power of hope of my people. The past. Before colonisation, thousands of years ago, our men were strong. They still are strong. 
Our women were strong, and they still are strong. Our babies were healthy. The sicknesses we had were treatable through our own traditional bush medicines. In my buddy my language, we call this guruma. Guruma is bush medicines. We used our guruma, our own medicines, to treat the sicknesses that we had. And the sicknesses that we had wasn't chronic uh, heart conditions, it wasn't diabetes, but it was sicknesses that we used to get, uh, you know, whether it was from a bite from an insect or, you know, something from the land. It wasn't illnesses that you see in modern day and age. But we still use our gurumas till this day. Now let's draw it to the present. The present the current state of my people's health. The current state of our people's health is that we are expected to live 11.7 years less than non-Indigenous people. Why is that? My grandfather lived till he was 58. All of my father's 13 siblings have diabetes and heart-related diseases, renal diseases, just to name a few. Growing up, I thought it was normal to see a lot of my elders, aunties and uncles sick. It was because being ill and visiting the ill was so common that it eventually became the norm. Now you tell me, how is that healthy? Because it isn't. But this is just a very brief insight on what it is like for us and for our people every single day. And adding on to that, I just want to talk about the two boys that passed away in WA two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago. They were chased by two police, by two police officers, if I can recall. And one of them was my cousin that passed away. So it makes you wonder, why are two young Aboriginal boys running away from the current justice system that they would rather drown than be arrested? And that comes down to thinking about the poor treatment of my people in the justice space, in the health space, in the education space. Many members in my own family have passed on from illnesses that were preventable, but they were misdiagnosed and it ended in unfortunate circumstances. We need more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across all fields, but especially health. We need more of our people working in health services. We need more of our people working in health services that are community controlled, Aboriginal led and Aboriginal run. But how can we achieve this? It can't be achieved by not listening to us. You need to listen to us. And to listen to us, you need to hear us because you can listen, but are you actually hearing? Every community is different and the needs for every community are different. Not all Aboriginal people are the same and not all Aboriginal communities are the same, which ties it back, ties me into the future. How can we achieve this? How can we walk alongside each other and work alongside each other? How can we close this gap? How can we, you know, walk alongside, walk along the bridge and close this gap? You know, sit down and yarn with us, don't yarn for us, listen to us. I see our young ones paving the way for future generations. I see our elders strong and healthy, passing on their knowledge and ways with ease and not with illnesses and disease. I see our beautiful culture embedded in the way our health services will function. The gap will be non-existent. With more community-controlled health services, they'll have a majority Indigenous health staff focus. Again, Aboriginal-led and Aboriginal-run. With the power of hope of my people and the power of my people, we can do anything. But this foreseeable future can only be achieved if our voices are listened to and heard. Again, you can listen, but are you actually hearing? This setting that we are in right now, this beautiful room at the Wheeler Centre, um, you know, is a perfect reflection of what listening to us looks like. The mere fact that I'm standing up here um, on this amazing panel um, with all of you amazing people, that's what listening to us looks like. Um, you know, we're in these man-made buildings, but underneath all that lies more than 60,000 years worth of strong traditions and culture that is well and truly alive today. And we shouldn't forget that. Listening to us means eliminating this spoken or unspoken superior, superior, superiority complex, but acknowledging that we Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people know what's best for our people. But I would like to end on this, with the power of hope and the power of my people and the knowledge my people have had for the last 60,000 plus years. The knowledge that we continue to pass down to our young ones, our Mayus and Buddhas. Our beautiful culture has paved the way for thousands of years. We've been people of resilience for thousands of years. We are still people of resilience. We are still people of strength. We are still here and we are still proud and we are still strong. Our voices are not weak, but our voices are strong. We pass those voices on to our young ones. 
we pass that strength on to our young ones. And we need hope, because without hope, we can't walk forward. If we don't have hope, then where's the humanity? We need to be able to work alongside each other and walk alongside each other. We need to be able to open up our hearts to learning and self-learning. Self-learning is so important. It's not, you know, I always say, it's not an Aboriginal person's responsibility to teach people about Aboriginal people. It also comes down to self-learning as well. Um, we have this beautiful platform to be able to yarn and have, you know, important conversations. And I think change is here and change is now. Um, and we're all, we're all a part of that journey. So we need hope. And I'd like to end on one of my favourite quotes from one of my heroes, Malcolm X. And he said, if you want something, you better make some noise. <laughs> well, I'm here and I'm making that noise. <laughs> Um, but thank you for listening to me and I really, really, really hope that you were able to carry on from what I said and I really meant everything that I said from the bottom of my heart. The fact that we're here, that within itself is a powerful statement of change. And you know, change comes from people and to be passionate about, to, to be passionate about change, you need to stand for change. And I think we all stand for change and I think that's so important for all of us to carry with us. So thank you. I'd like to introduce the next amazing speaker, Jane Vadivelu. Jane Vadivelu is the founding CEO of Children's Ground. She has a master's in forensic psychology and has a 20 year history leading reform and services provision with communities experiencing extreme disadvantage and trauma. She has lived in the Northern Territory for 19 years and has over 30 years connections with RD people in Central Australia. In 2000, Jane founded Akiyulara, one of the first organisations based on First Nations knowledge systems in traditional healing and wellbeing. She has worked with children, families and communities at high risk, establishing strength and justice-based approaches to achieve long-term change. She has worked with William Tilmouth for 15 years, culminating in the foundation and director of Children's Ground. Children's Ground was created as a 25-year approach to ensure that future generations of children are afforded equity, access and justice to, to, to determine their futures, to have quality education, health, social and economic opportunities that privilege their first culture with a global context. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. I too would like to pay my respects to the, to the traditional owners of these beautiful lands, the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, to the ancestors who are still with us today, to the elders from yesterday, today and tomorrow that carry on the oldest living cultures in the world, to the incredible Con, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here, for having all of us here, for giving us a voice, and for your book, book A Bible on Humanity and the beauty and the power of hope and love. And I too am talking about the power of love because it can defy the worst of humanity. I was born in Wagga Wagga and I'm not originally from these lands. But over the past 26 years, I've come to know intimately the most brutal of human violence, people who are hidden inside the carcasses of animals to protect them from being stolen, children who have watched their siblings being murdered people who experience pain and who inflict pain. The human condition, it's both robust and fragile. It's vicious and it's beautiful. It's inglorious and magnificent all at once and all of us have shades of these things at any time in our lives. But the system that is most brutal, most punishing, are those created by our governments. They are known by our governments and they are controlled by our governments and they're protected by the privileged, and they create incredible, incredible torture. But my love story started 35 years ago in my childhood when I met Kuman, a woman from Central Australia, an Aranda woman, who would become my sister and closest friend. And 22 years ago, after I'd been working at Pentridge for a few years, and that's a whole other story, before it became a hotel, I jumped on a train and I headed to Alice Springs to see her 
And it wasn't my first time there, but it was my first time to live there. And I was confronted by the truth of the enacted genocide in our first peoples and the impact on the people that I love. The earth was soaked with its first people's blood. The injured, the dying, the maimed, the homeless, the walking wounded, it was like a war zone. The crushing and the suffocation of cultural life and identity. And the sadness for me is that 20, 20 years later, it hasn't changed much. And today's human rights catastrophe is not that 100% of young people in the Northern Territory are in jail, of, of people, young people in, in custody are at First Nations, or that those have been tortured under the care of the state, or that beautiful young men have died at the hands of those who have a duty of care for them. But the catastrophe is that those of us who have privilege and influence are allowing it to continue. A system that's executing human rights abuses every day in every Aboriginal community, and this is not a problem of Aboriginal people, it is ours. We allow the continued violence and denial of their sovereign rights, and the rejection of the statement from the heart was the most recent assault. So all of us who have made our homes on these lands but are not of these lands, we must act to deliver justice which is well overdue. The people I know that I work with, they live in outrageous conditions. It is their grandchildren and children who end up in Dondale in jail, falling out of school, unemployed and early death. Felicity Hayes, the, tradi the traditional owner of Alice Springs, lives in a tin shed, despite securing native title 18 years ago. No running water, turned off by the government, no power. MK, the epitome of love, has buried three children and grandchildren. Teresa buried her son, who was chased down and racially murdered, and then buried her other son a year later after he'd been missing and found dead. But these are our leaders. No one chooses poverty. Nobody chooses to bury their children. But there is another story, and it's the power of resistance. Because profound injustice gives rise to the greatest of humanity. From these overcrowded homes arise our leaders, change makers, teachers, healers, visionaries. Love is everywhere. The old people are formidable, human rights champions, some of the greatest strategists you will ever meet in your life. MK has an Order of Australia medal and published three books. Teresa's art is in the National Gallery. They're on dialysis three times a week. They should be retired, but they are the professors. So instead, on their walking frames, out in their cars, out bush, in boardrooms, providing governance and direction, working on land rights, instructing lawyers, educating anthropologists, teaching children, squeezing every little bit out of every day. Economic poverty and ill health is, just, is a distraction and an unrelenting stress, but it does not define them. Children's ground arose from this incredible lifetime of work and knowledge to create a new system to dismantle justice, injustice and to defy the tidal force of colonisation. It's led by First Peoples, it privileges First Cultures, languages, laws, to deliver dignity and rights. For culture holds identity and language holds culture. Well, now we are seeing whole communities mobilised around their children, driving their decisions, creating a new status quo for the next generation where safety, rights, voice, language, culture, opportunity are the norm. For First Nations people, as you know and you can hear and you can see, are not diminished by colonial history. They are grounded in their identity. They know who they are. No matter the br brutality, degrading treatment and indignity they face at the hands of our government. Their law and belonging comes from a land that can never be stolen. It's in one's mind and spirit and knowing. There is no misery or self-indulgence, no self-pity or self-righteousness. There's laughter and joy, there's sadness and pain, but overriding everything is a responsibility to law, culture and the next generation. And how lucky are we that the oldest living cultures in the world are alive in Australia, resisting 230 years of relentless attack. Systems of knowledge, society, law developed since the beginning of humankind and sustained. Theirs is a history longer than your imagination embedded in the land, in songlines, in languages, in art and dance, in health and learning and science and history, in social structures and kinship that would baffle the invaders in its complexity. What the West defines as leading practice is found in spades in First Nations systems of knowledge. 
MK, Teresa, so many who have endured unimaginable hardship and pain. They hold no bitterness. They open their hearts. They share their knowledge. They could hate, but they love. They could judge, but they give acceptance. And I'm always inspired by the power of their humanity. The greatest leaders who command in silence and role model dignity. So my story of hope has come from sitting, listening, learning, of being vulnerable and knowing nothing. Unlearning the nonsense that we are infected by about being experts in other people's lives. Knowing that if one life is diminished, then all of our lives are. And that injustice is a created condition. But that if you honour people, back their voice, their vision, hear and trust in their solutions, the solutions they know to be true, that change happens and magic happens and you breathe life into hope. William Tilmouth, my friend, my mentor, the chair of Children's Ground, a man stolen at the age of five, but returned, says to me, Jane, we are in the business of hope. So under the forces of privilege and oppression across this world, there are thriving cultures and families defined not by their struggle, but by their strength, their culture and their identity, and the power of hope and love. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now love to introduce Carolina Cabezas. Carolina is a PhD candidate in the F Faculty of Education at Monash University. Her research focuses on multilingualism and multilingual education in the early years, early years, excuse me, exploring how young children, educators and families negotiate and practice languages in early childhood classrooms. Carolina's interest includes auto-ethnographic and post-qualitative research approaches, as well as the use of performance and poetry as methods of inquiry in education research. Put your hands together. Buenas noches a todos. Con muchas gracias uh, por tenerme aquí. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, voy a hablar del poder del lenguaje. I'm going to talk today about the power of language. It is in and through my languages that I experience the world. In and through my languages, I make sense of my identities, cultures, knowledges, and the whole of my embodied experience. My languages are my tools, my memories, my values, my histories, and thus, it is through my languages that I understand, feel, sense, express every now and then, every then and now. My languages mean social positioning, access and opportunity, and thus it is through my languages that I embody other worlds, another's world. My languages are exciting, frustrating, enlightening, confusing, empowering, debilitating. My languages are a process, a field, a repertoire a voice and silence, joy and despair, friendship and desolation. It is in the in-between that my languages exist, that they depend on where I am and to whom I speak. More than one language doesn't mean I speak more. In fact, many times it means I don't speak at all. It is in this struggle that my languages persist and they transgress the emotional, psychological and tangible body. They transgress cultural, political, and economical bodies to become negotiations, inherent in learning to be, in learning to listen, learning to understand, negotiations inherent in my obligation to produce. Then this and more I do through my languages. I started researching the practice and power of languages in early childhood education and care seven years ago because I felt a profound discomfort with the unquestioned imposition of English monolingualism as an implicit precondition for children to access full social participation, learning, and play. Today, one in three children attending an early childhood setting are speakers of a minority or minoritized language. 
In this context, it's hard to ignore the paradoxical celebration of cultural and linguistic diversity in English only. The systematic exclusion of children's mother tongue from all aspects of teaching and learning results in elusive instances of discrimination, stigmatization, and silence. This raises very problematic situations and outcomes in relation to children's rights to express themselves and communicate fully and freely, their right to free speech, as well as a right to use and continue learning their family language. For the past seven years, I've encountered proliferating scenes of children of color being isolated, playing on their own, keeping quiet for extended periods of time, sometimes months being rejected by other children when daring to enter play, speaking tongues, trying to express themselves, wanting to communicate but not being understood. Educators, on the other hand, make efforts to include them. They use keywords insistently, repeatedly, slowly, condescendently at times, trusting the assumption that because they're young, they'll pick it up, English, as an additional language quickly, disregarding that this comes at the expense of children's mother tongues. Language is never neutral, and scenes like this reiterates in the life of language minority children every day, all throughout the day, as they are immersed in English monolingual programs. I asked the kindergarten teacher to explain how she viewed the experience of, of children who are learning English in her classroom, and this is what she had to say. Quote, I think they're an observing participant in the group. They do stand back and they just observe and watch. Or they do a lot of that solitary play where they just go and draw, just something they would do on their own, rather than collaborate early on and be part of the whole group or do a group building. Close quote. While well, English speakers socialize broadly and deeply, crack jokes, learn about gravity, magnetism, sinking and floating, language minority children are made to stand on the side trying to catch up or simply ignoring what's going on. So I wonder, what is it really that young children are learning by standing on, on the margins, not being able to express themselves and communicate what they do know? how they do know. What do others learn by watching from the center? How do we interpret words when, we, when they carry no meaning to us? How long is it too long to be isolated? And how short is it too short to be silenced when you're four years old? Let's go back in time. It's 1987. It's a classroom in Texas. I vividly remember the feeling of being tongue-tied. I'm six years old and knowing I can't speak generates a weight in my gut as if a string of rocks is pulling down my throat. I stand heavy and paralyzed. My eyes begin to tear, my lips twist, my hands tremble. I want to run away and hide. Justice, justice, make, the, make this panic go away. I'm resigned to think that my voice is no thing here. It's not English and they won't understand. My Spanish screams and echoes empty inside me. My teacher's words are like little soldiers invading my ears. Their sound confuses me. Their meaning escapes me. My heart foreshadows the impending isolation I will feel as soon as she turns around. She finds my gaze and stays, and stays for a little while. Her eyes touch mine. She smiles. My tongue still tied, but for a second, my heartbeat calms down. I'm saved for now. Don't let her turn away. Today, the Australian early childhood education and care workforce is one of the most linguistically and culturally diverse in the world. I believe we have an opportunity and a an enormous and promising opportunity to reimagine a multilingual education system that not only acknowledges but enacts children's rights to use and learn their family language as well as our shared community language. I also hope that through multilingual education we can all 
enjoy a more equitable, creative and innovative way of being and learning through intercultural exchange and understanding. Thank you. <laughs> it is my honor now to introduce Alicia Fernando. Alicia is Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Melbourne, where she is responsible for leading diversity and inclusion portfolio across the university, with a strong focus on the implementation of programs, initiatives supporting five key pillars, gender, LGBTI+, disability, mental health and well-being, indigenous, ethnicity and race. Alicia is a recipient of a full scholarship to the Victorian government's 2018 Joan Kirner Young, an Emerging Women's Leaders Program, which enables up and coming female leaders to obtain the critical skills, networks, and experiences required for advancement. It will empower women to progress as influential leaders in their communities, sectors, and areas of interest. Please join me in welcoming Alicia. Hi everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners on the land on which we gather, the Wurundjeri and Burung elders, past, present and those that are emerging, and acknowledge their connection to land and water and extend my respects to all First Nations people and those that are here tonight. Fangirling over two of them here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Keisha Day, Maddie Miller and Melissa Saunders, three deadly women who guided me through some of what I have to say tonight. Um, they guided me so that I, I could ensure that I didn't speak for First Nations people, but as an ally. When Con asked me to be a part of tonight, my mouth said yes before my brain had a chance to fully understand <laughs> and comprehend what he was asking. So when my brain finally eventually caught up, I went to a part emotional and part anxiety meltdown. Um, I had to think long and hard about what power or superpower I was going to speak about and eventually landed on the power of resilience. Resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, to possess a level of toughness. I was born in the shadow of the Vietnam War to parents that graduated from university. And because of that, they faced imprisonment and persecution on a daily basis. My mother, the eldest of seven, my father, an only child to a single mother. Their many attempts to escape the country all ended in their money being stolen or them both being captured and jailed. This is the story of my father's resilience. On one attempted escape, my parents were captured. My mum, being heavily pregnant with me, was released and my dad thrown into jail. Dad, not wanting to miss my birth, staged a daring escape. He waded through mud and quicksand and tried to get to his wife's side. He submerged himself below the surface of muddy water to avoid being detected. And when he came up for air, he had a gun pointed at his head. He was a dead man. But on that day, the miracle of humanity prevailed and the guard aiming the gun at my dad's, my dad's head turned and allowed my dad to escape with his life. Dad made it to my birth. It took my parents multiple more times up until I turned the age of two to successively escape persecution and threats of imprisonment. This is a story of my mother's resilience. As our small boat floated aimlessly in the South China Sea, we had run out of food and water and our boat's engine had given up. There was nothing left to do but to pray that death would be quick and painless. Just as we gave up all hope, a pod of dolphins appeared and guided our stricken boat into the path of Dutch, a Dutch cargo ship. Over what seemed like a lifetime, the ship inched closer until they were close enough to drop a rope ladder down and asked for someone to climb up and speak to them. My mum, all of 45 kilos and five foot tall, mustered up all her strength that she had left and scaled those 
um, ladder, scaled that ladder, she was also scared of heights and scared of water. <laughs> With what English she had left, uh, sorry, what English she had learnt at school, she managed to convince that captain and his crew to rescue all passengers of our boat. This is a story of my resilience. Landing in Tasmania, coming from Vietnam, was a shock in so many ways. Where was the rickshaws? the wet markets, the street vendors, and most importantly, the sun. <laughs> With no English, no money, no family, no identity, life was pretty hard. A majority of my childhood was spent catching up. Catching up on how to communicate, to converse. Catching up on the culture that was so very different to my own. Catching up on learning how to walk between two worlds, trying hard, not to hate myself for looking like this, but often failing. I also haven't kept caught up on growing up taller, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was told, go back to where you come from. Gooks aren't welcome here. A teacher said she's got learning difficulties. She can't read at the same level as her peers. I was also told, don't bother trying too hard. You're a woman, you're Asian, and you're short. You're never going to make it to management. And most recently, you're a bleeding heart. There's no room in this Western corporate world for the likes of you. If it weren't for the resilience of my parents and what they had showed and instilled in me, I would have faltered many years ago. I would have given up. I would have believed every single person who told me that I was lesser, too compassionate, too bitchy, too different. This is a story of the community's resilience. When my family arrived in Australia as refugees, it was the community that welcomed us, that helped us, that cared and nurtured us. As a community, I feel that it's even more important today than 36 years ago for our community to hold on to our values, especially in the face of the current political climate, to be resilient, especially for those that do not have an equal voice. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to show such strength and resilience from first contact to the thousands of years since in the face of abuse, trauma, inequities and discrimination. When invited, we should follow their lead and lend our voice in real solidarity when it matters. Our LGBTIQA communities who just received the right to legally marry, a first step in still a very long road ahead. We can't afford to rest on our laurels and must continue to advocate for greater awareness and inclusion. Those of us whose lives are impacted by mental health, disability, who experience homelessness, who are marginalised, who experience societal invisibility. We can all take action and become more aware of the issues and use our voices and actions to demand that society does not turn away but turn towards. To bring invis the invisible into the often uncomfortable but much needed consciousness. I believe the community, we, need to be more resilient than ever. As allies, let's support our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends so that we can all march towards meaningful equality and self-determination without obstacles and on their terms. Let's voice our disgust and opposition to those that suggest that African gangs have taken over our state and that we are too scared to venture out. Well, not you guys, you guys are here. <laughs> um, let's boycott cake shops wedding venues and caterers that choose not to accept our LGBTIQA community's business. Let's stop looking at someone's disability as a challenge that's too hard. Let's instead look at someone's ability and ask, what can they do and how can we create opportunities for them to be active contributors? And next time members of the pale male and stale community try to minimise a woman's voice, or launch into a mansplaining moment and try to tell us that our jobs, promotions, funding, or positions of power based on merit, let's call out their BS. <laughs> let's all work to ensure that those that are too different 
are recognised, welcomed, valued and are different no more. The power of our individual resilience contributes to this and, shows, and should not be understated. But the power of resilience of the community fighting for our collective differences together is real power. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a real moment for me because I fangirl over Layla so much and it's my complete honour and privilege to be introducing her tonight. So please uh, welcome Layla Gurunwin. You'd think I'd be able to say it, but I'm so nervous. <laughs> Gurunwinwi is a proud Yongle woman originally from Galawinku in, on Elko Island in northeast Arnhem Land. Growing up most of her life in Bendigo, Victoria, later fini finished Year 12 in Melbourne and six months after finishing VCE was thrown into the deep end when the Marangook footy show was co commissioned by, the, uh, by NITV to begin as a television show in 2017. Since then, Layla has, a regular, has been a regular of the footy show's family, presenting new, the news, injury reports, interviewing current and former Indigenous and non-Indigenous footy players, as well as having a women's tipping, tipping segment called Titus, Titus, sorry, Tips. Um, in the past two years, Layla has been a regular panellist along Gilbert McAdam, Grant Hansen and Shelley Ware. Please welcome Layla. There goes my pen. Oh, thanks, Con. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks, Alicia, for that. She was, oh, I'm just so, one, I'm sweating up a storm because I'm so nervous. I'm extremely overwhelmed to be talking in front of people. Um, you'd think working on television for the last 11 years that I'd be okay with this, but not so much still. Um, and I am overwhelmed at the fact that I am speaking after so many amazing women who have shared their stories and of course the amazing woman who will be going after me. Um, but before I start, my name is Laura Ridialpi Mindali Gurawiwi, but most people know me as Layla. And as a proud Yungal woman originally from North East Arnhem Land, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are on, the land I have been so blessed to live and thrive on, the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge all other Indigenous people who are in the room tonight. And I would also like to acknowledge the non-Indigenous people that are here in this space. I would like to acknowledge your elders and say that if it wasn't for the choices that your elders have made, you would not be here tonight. I would also like to say to all the people who are seeking asylum and who are refugees and who question their place in this country, me as a First Nations person, I welcome you. This is your home. Con, thank you so much for asking me to be here tonight. Um, I actually got invited to the Brownlow and I said to them, I'm sorry I have a prior engagement. <laughs> Frankly, um, there wouldn't be anywhere else that I would rather be than being here to, he to hear all these stories and share a little bit of mine with you as well. Um, and I think uh, it was really important, really cool, Con, that you got all of these amazing women up here to tell their stories because the theme for NAIDOC Week this year is, was actually because of her we can. So a big round of applause for Con for doing that. And thank you for asking me to come as well. As a show of hands, who likes music? Okay, who loves music? <laughs> okay, so I have three very vivid memories um, and all of them are around music. Uh, the first one was maybe when I was three or four years old and I was fighting for my mother's attention with my little sister at the time and she was actually teaching us a, a song called Taba Naba, which is a traditional Torres Strait Islander song. Um, my step-grandfather, who has been my only grandfather, 
uh, taught that to her and she taught that to us. Uh, it's still a song that remains in my heart now. Uh, two of my other memories that I have, one was being in a little tiny room in my grandmother, in my grandfather's house with about 20 of my cousins at the time, all ranging from the age of about three years old to about 21. And uh, we were all learning the moves to Get In Jiggy With It by Will Smith. <laughs> uh, and the last is a few years ago, I actually got to spend New Year's Eve on Alco Island, or Galawinku, my community, and it was the first time I'd spent New Year's Eve there. Um, for those who haven't been to Galawinku, and I'm pretty sure there's not a lot of people that have, um, Galawinku is a dry community, so um, we have discos on the basketball court as a way to celebrate and fireworks and, and whatnot. And, of course, Christmas is during monsoon season, so it was pouring down rain, but it didn't stop people from dancing. And that particular night, I'm one of eight, eight children, and that particular night, all seven of my siblings and myself all danced in the rain. Um, and it's the one and only time that I've ever been in the same space with all of my siblings. So those are my three kind of vivid memories of music. Bob Marley's Eye on Lion Zion. Paul Kelly's Dumb Things, Do Up That Thing by Lauren Hill, The Eagles' Hotel California, Beyonce's Formation, and Imagine by John Lennon. These are some of my go-to songs that also hold great significance and memories for me. My favourite musical era is Motown, and my number one favourite song is actually a tie between The Temptations' My Girl and What Becomes of the Broken Hearted by Jimmy Ruffin. Today I would like to speak about the power of music and its power in my life. I recently got to go to Jamaica and visit Nine Mile, which is the birthplace and resting place of the one and only Robert Nesta Marley, or Bob Marley, the king of reggae. And just being in that space and in that place where so many of his songs were written, whose music, lyrics and messages touched my life on such a profound level, made me quite emotional. But music has a way of doing that though, like nothing else can. When I feel down, I listen to music. When I celebrate with family and friends, there's always music. When I start a new health kick and I want to get to the gym and run on that treadmill, even though I hate doing it, <laughs> to pump myself up, I listen to music. When I'm stuck in the inevitable Melbourne peak hour traffic jam, which feels like it goes on forever and ever, my saving grace so I don't go crazy is music. Music reminds me of people gone but not forgotten. It reminds me of road trips, chill out house parties, barbecues and dances shared with the people that I love the most. But it also reminds me of the many concerts and festivals that I've been priv privileged enough to attend, sitting next to complete strangers who just so happen to love the same music as I do and sharing that fleeting moment with them. The music, I believe, transcends language and culture and religion and race. Because music, when it speaks to you, and when you truly feel it, it touches your soul. Music can calm a crowd or create an amazing frenzy. It can make you want to get up and dance. Music inspires you. It can convey messages of love, desire, hope, trials and tribulations and overcoming them of change, equality, power, people's realities, of loss, of acceptance, or of just having a really, really good time. Music allows me to stay true to myself through my traditional manike, song, and bungal, dance. It connects me and us to our culture and traditions. Music can also make you cry and leave you speechless. Have you ever tried to watch a movie without music? A score in a movie can create emotion to help enhance your experience of the storytelling. Its sole purpose is to make you feel emotion, to make you feel sad or happy or scared or overjoyed or powerful and pumped. A good score is always memorable. Think of Harry Potter 
or Pirates of the Caribbean, Star Wars, E.T. or Mission Impossible. Maybe you're a Jurassic Park fan or the Titanic or The Godfather or Jaws. Or my favourite, my personal favourite, which is actually the first movie that I ever got to see in cinema, The Lion King. <laughs> the opening sequence still gets me to this day, actually. And if you haven't already noticed, I'm also a bit of a film buff. <laughs> Music is not just an art form. It allows us to see different perspectives. It's an outlet for freedom, an outlet to express yourself. It is the rhythm of life and it is the food for the soul. It connects us and adds colour to what would be a pretty dreary world. Music is an escape and music is constant. The first musical beat you hear is one you hear before you even enter the world, the sound of your mother's heartbeat. So even if you haven't done it now, well, you probably already have, go home and find your happy song, find your sad song, find your power song, find your fight song, and make those your soundtrack to life and follow them into the world. People always ask me what my number one favourite song is, but never ever ask me what my number two song is. <laughs> so I'll share that here with you today. My second song, my second favourite song of all time is actually Imagine by John Lennon. And not just because of the fact that John Lennon was a member of one of the greatest bands of all time, the Beatles. Um, I know that's depending on who you are. <laughs> but Imagine gives me hope for a world that we could possibly live in. And when I listen to this particular song, I always think, imagine a day when we all love each other as much as we love music. Thank you. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our last speaker for the night, another powerful woman, Abiola Ajeta Mobi. Yes, my apologies if I got that wrong, Abiola. <laughs> Abiola is the director of the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre Initiative Innovative Innovation Hub. My apologies. Abiola has more than 17 years management experience in local and state government, as well in not, as well as in non-for-profit organisations, both here and overseas. Originally from Nigeria and fluent in both English and Yoruba, she brings a strong focus to innovation and developing processes to bring stakeholder ideas into organisational activities and decision making. In 2015, Abiola won the Future Leader Award at the International Women's Women's Day Awards in the Southern Metropolitan Region of Melbourne. Amazing accomplishment. Aviola's current role is with the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre where she oversees empowerment programs and services that foster people seeking asylum ability to thrive. So please, a big round of applause for Aviola. <laughs> Thank you, Con, for this rare opportunity, and Leila, for the warm introduction. I'm really privileged to stand in front of you today to speak and to be on the stage with this amazing, wonderful women. And my topic today is on the power of shameless audacity. <laughs> the audacity of a colored woman, the unreserved boldness that it takes for a woman of color even at the risk of being rejected or undermined to reach for the skies. Why do I talk about this? Because they inspire me a lot. Coming to Australia in 2008 and wanting and starting to dream again and wanting to be the best that I could be, I needed to find women that look like me that have done it. And I started to study them and to emulate them and to read about their quotes and their speeches, which has really been a fool for me to push forward. In, so for people that also follow me on social media, you probably know that I have a crush for people, women of color. And every time I see them attaining a great height or getting in positions that you know, defer the hordes, I always promote that and, and give them a chair. I, but mainly the multi-layers um, multi of marginalization that they overcome and the great successes that they've achieved 
in an audacious way is what really inspires me. Women, and particularly women of color, are severely underrepresented globally across all spheres of power. Women of color suffer uniquely from the unconscious bias that affects our interactions, often not seen or even known about, being rendered invisible, and it this keenly felt in critical decision-making domains as well. When you, and there's a, there's, there is a strange power that actually identifies us as women of color, which is the power of shameless audacity, the willingness, the drive, the inner strength to keep going in spite of all odds. When you read about Aborigines making up 3% of the population, you understand to speak with a collective voice. And today, what I'm hoping to get out of my speech is to make sure that I represent the women of color and bring that collective voice to life. Through all this, they have such a rare inner strength and resilience, like I said, to keep going and never give up. Many of these women I read about, I meet on my day-to-day -day life, many on the stage with me today, and many I work with and I work alongside of, particularly women seeking asylum, women who have ex experienced trauma, tribulations, despair, and finally landed on the shores of Australia, but yet having this unexplainable courage and confidence to dream again. Many of them from countries where women are seen but not heard. Today I will share about a few of the women who has inspired me with their shameless audacity, particularly the women that are in Australia. The first woman I want to talk about today is called Tasnin, and this woman I've never met, but I've followed her for over five years now. She's a seasoned speaker who happens to be a woman, who happens to be a colored Muslim woman. It has taken her years to establish a public voice in spaces typically dominated by minority, majority of Anglo-Australian persons, ascertaining herself against misconception and other arbor of commonplace. You might be wondering, what has race got to do with this? She said in one of our speeches, and I quote, erasing from the conversation, erasing race from the conversation ignored, ignores discriminatory realities of women of color, ex that women of color experience, experiences specifically. And asking us to not bring up this in the very reason, is the very reason it must be named. I cannot emphasize how emotionally exhausting these struggles are, unquote. While it may seem easy to believe that we just need to work harder to gain success, we know otherwise. Women of color need the voice, need the space, need the opportunity, and need the environment to be able to thrive. When it comes to the heart of community groups, a woman I know, and I've had the privilege to be on a panel with, and continues to inspire me, is Eugenia Flynn, identifying as an Aboriginal Chinese Malaysian Muslim woman. She is found on, on a lot of platforms. She's part of magazines in the gallery. She's in a committee of women, in, in, particularly in Literacy Hearts, Australia, and also volunteers with rice refugees, survivors, and ex-detainees. She's also the current CEO of Social Studio in Collingwood, Melbourne. One of the stories I love about and Eugenia is actually the story of her mom, where she talked about how she's raised them with strong cultural values especially being a woman of Malaysian and Asian background and married to an Aboriginal man. She's, and Eugene says, and I quote, one of the things that fascinates, me, um, that, that fascinates me about my mom and continue to inspire me, I think, is, is our ability to instill in us what justify, what, what just define, what's ability to, to instill in us was just defying those stereotypes. She was such a fiercy woman, a real fighter. She would always challenge the status quo and people. She really instills in us how to be a strong woman. I call that audacious. Another, 
Another incredible woman I want to talk about tonight is a woman called, named Ruby Lynn. Ruby Lynn is the founder of Ruby Lynn Makeup and Artistry. Poss possibly you might not know this, but for many women, particularly women of color, makeup can be a source of confidence and self-esteem. The choice to cover off our perceived flaws should be available to every woman regardless of our skin, tone, or socioeconomic background. Ruby Lynn is a registered nurse and has been living in Australia now for the past eight years. She, like, like myself and other women of color, sometimes have to do the, 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 the transaction online to get our makeups from overseas, just because we can't find anything that suits our color. In Australia, we can find things like eyeshadows, but foundation and concealers that match black skin are very difficult to find, often very little in the market. Rubilin started to wonder why this was so and if she was the only one facing the problem. So she opened the Facebook page to talk about it. Little did she know, did she know that there were so many women that are going through the same. There was no market to cater for her needs. Rubilin decided there and then that she wants to do something about it. She began looking for a manufacturer and, and to create a line for her. She couldn't afford the fees, but what she did was she, to make them her mentors. So they actually told her oh, what to do, <laughs> and she did just that. After about 18 months, she, she, and she and created her own product with mineral foundation, and then she started to sell. Today, most African women are benefiting from Ruby Lane's makeup. Not only from that, but from her ability to see beauty as a way of boosting confidence, particularly in societies and environments where women of color, particularly our youth, are feeling displaced and lacking identity. The audacious nature, nature of women of color become, it's incredible to me. The lack of shame, the unreserved boldness like I talked about earlier. There are two, you, you, you probably know this, that there are too few women in top leadership position in Australia generally. Men and women alike are calling for change. This issue has been apparent for many for, many for a long time, but getting meaningful movement in the numbers have proven to be tough, particularly for women of color. The underrepresentation of women in, in boardrooms and leadership positions needs serious and urgent attention. It can be, sometimes I've had conversations with people and it all comes down to the case of merit and quotas. But I'm sure many of you will have your opinions. My opinion is that privileges are unique to those who have it. So they just claim it to be merit, because that's comfortable. And to hold these amazing women of color on stage who have had the opportunity to speak to you about different issues that they care about the most, the audacity to not only be a voice, but to be a respected one in their, in their various environments are the things that inspire me. I'm a mother of four, four daughters, and to, for my daughters to be raised in a way that Australia is giving them the best opportunity that they can be able to achieve, regardless of their race, their skin color, their religion, or their background is something I always fight for. And that's probably why I care about how women of color are being perceived and treated in our society. I would like to finish by just something that inspires me about these women on stage. They probably don't know this. <laughs> Jane, your tenacity and over two decades of lead, leading the reform of service provision with community experiencing extreme disadvantage and trauma, I think is an incredible resilience that I'm really proud of and I'm, and I'm sure you are too. Carolina, your incredible effort in helping us understand how early childhood teachers could support our, our children in school and make, them, and make the English learning a better experience for them. It's incredible. Alicia, she's, she's looking at me, what do you want to say? <laughs> I'm actually inspired and humbled by how you flee war and how your family have defied all odds and for where you are today. I think it's an incredible story. And many women will be proud of that, including myself. Leila, I always um, admire you on TV. 
I think being able to get into the media world as a woman of color, it's extraordinary. And even being in the sporting field as well, I don't know how you do it, but I take my hats off for you. These women here, and including Corn, I'm adding you to the list. I'm incredibly grateful for, because they've showed me the path to how things can be possible. My journey of 10 years in Australia wouldn't have been possible without all these women that I read about, that I study, that I learn from on a day-to-day -day basis, many of whom don't even know my name. But that's how much they've inspired me. I'll finish with a quote from Dr. Raji Abhikaraja. She's the Chief Operating Officer for Women in Finance in New South Wales. And she was receiving an award recently, and she, she said, and I quote, seeing good examples of women of color in leadership plays a crucial role in the beliefs and the spirit of the next generation. For many women, including me, this creates an inner, inner will to not let racism, sexism, or unconscious bias stop us from reaching our goals. The Australia we live today is what will get talked about tomorrow. So our behaviors, our legacy, our footprint will become the shadows that guides our next generation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. I now have the honor of welcoming Corn back to wrap up the, today's event. Okay. Uh, all I've got to say is the following. One, can we say a big thank you again to the Willow Centre for hosting us tonight? <laughs> I'm going to ask each of the incredible speakers to get up once more and could you, just, um, could you imagine instead of Peter Dutton, you had a <laughs> You had Layla. <laughs> Imagine instead of Alan Tudge, you had Alicia. Imagine instead of Tony Abbott, you had Carol. Imagine instead of Erica Betts, you had Jay. Imagine instead of Josh Frydenberg, you had <laughs> And we're talking about merit and voices, and you know you cannot be what you what what you cannot see. This is the future. You know, when I say the future is female, they say it for a good reason. And I just want to gain each of these incredible uh, leaders, these visionaries, these speakers to get up. Abiola, could you please get up again? Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. All of these incredible people are going to be out in a foyer um, taking your questions. So you're welcome to come and chat. Um, I'm going to be just at the back in the far left corner signing copies of my book if anyone wants them. And a big thank you to Paperback Books who have come along tonight. Uh, again, a huge thank you to all of you. Um, go and share this. Tell people about tonight. Um, and next time you have a panel, especially to the men in the room, the next time you have a panel, Shed your privilege. Open up spaces. If we're going to have an equal and just society, then as men, we need to fundamentally change because we actually are the bloody problem here. So I would like to take away the message around, let's create spaces to hear all of our voices. Let's create spaces to keep talking about the power of us together as a community. Thank you so much again for coming tonight. Thank you for the support. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.